Good evening, welcome to tonight's Irish House of Association meeting. Um, Andy is away on business, so, so bad luck can get me, but uh, I'll do my best to keep things uh, between the hedges. And um, I'm just going to point out that today is the first day of meteorological spring. And that's important, the meteorological bit. The weathermen have decided the spring starts on the 1st of March. We all know it starts on the 20th. Um, which is actually a deep and meaningful thing where the day becomes longer than the night. But uh, we'll have a look at what's going on anyway. So we've got a few little past programs tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about the night sky. Um, Terry is going to deliver his teaser. And then our main speaker, Dr. Ryan Milligan, is uh, waiting in the wings here. And we have his screen, and it works, we believe. We're fairly <laughs> confident. Um, it was a bit of a struggle. Um, a couple of things going on, really. Um, first of all, last Saturday, we did really our first big event for quite a long time, um, since, since Covid and all that. It seems, it seems strangely like a long time ago now, doesn't it? But uh, um, it's not really that long ago. But, uh, so we had this event down at the Lockney Discovery Centre. Um, and we were a bit overwhelmed, I think, by the fact that some 1,200 people turned up and we uh, and we ended up doing not four star shows in the dome that we thought we were going to do, but we did seven. Um, it's still a bit of a long night, really, but uh, I want to thank everyone who was involved in that. Um, um, all the members of the council who pulled together on that, we, um, we delivered it despite uh, some certain difficulties. Um, particularly Terry, obviously, who, uh, who put all that together, and I think Terry doesn't get enough appreciation for the work he does behind the scenes. Give for Terry a round of applause. Um, we've got another thing coming up at the end of the month, which I'm quite heavily involved in, and that is the uh, Irish Astronomy Week from 20th to 26th of March. It's a, it's a whole bunch of events uh, all across the island, mostly organised by my friend Ronan Newman down in County Mayo. Um, he sort of asked me, with my IFAS hat on, to help out a bit, so I'm getting involved in the organisation of that bit. But, uh, um, and, and another friend of, of ours, um, Sinead um, Connemara, is uh, now on that team as well. Uh, we will be doing some events there. We needed to get through um, the the and Science Festival first, but we'll be doing something in that week ourselves. Um, I've got a whole few talks lined up, um, libraries and schools and that sort of thing. Um, so that's uh, there. We're very close to our target of 100 events across all four provinces of Ireland um, and one vision just to get people looking up. So that's uh, Irish Astronomy Week, I'll tell you more about that as it happens. Okay, looking at the sun. Now the sun um, has got one particularly active area at the moment, um, which is this one here, it's, uh, it's uh, well, I can't read the number here, it's uh, 3234, three, and that's been firing off um, for several days now actually. Um, including last night there was an M-class flare, in fact it was merely an X-class flare, and that hasn't even got here yet, that was uh, yesterday, we'll just look at that, there are, that's it firing off. Um, it has been doing so for a few days now, it's sort of moving towards the edge of the sun where it won't uh, be giving us any more auroras after a while, but still this one, this flare could bring something for the weekend, and there's also a coronal hole facing our direction. Uh, which may give us some action. This was my view from Valley um, about half past eleven on Sunday night. Uh, it was actually the third time I'd been down there that evening. Um, I saw that there was something going on behind the clouds earlier, um, but it was about 90% cloud cover. Then I, I went down again about 10 o'clock, and uh, it wasn't, again, there was cloud cover and much going on. I went down there half past eleven. And this all just kicked off in front of me, just lasted about 10 minutes or so. Um, but real, you know, greens and red beams going some 45 degrees high and so on. Very good. Now, needless to say, um, that is not exactly what I saw, because the eye doesn't do 10 second exposures and my camera does. But uh, um, so the camera doesn't lie, but the camera does drag more out of it than the eye sees. What I saw was a green glow, it was definitely green. Um, the red areas were largely white fog, 
but that's just how the eye does it. it. The eye is much more sensitive to green than it is to red, so you have to get really bright auroras to see the reds and sometimes blues and purples as well. But uh, um, this is really good because um, where we are at the minute, this is solar cycle 25. Uh, now this was the prediction, the red line. That was the prediction for solar cycle 25, which they said was going to be pretty much like cycle 24, or the last one. Um, but actually, we seem to be getting ahead of that. We seem to be going up higher and faster in terms of sunspot numbers uh, than, than we'd expected. So it could be quite good. Fingers crossed. Um, peaking expected sort of July 2025 or thereabouts. And um, they tend to go on for quite a while after the peak. Um, so we'll, we'll keep the fingers crossed. Now the moon phases, these are quite important for observing because you don't kind of want to go looking for faint objects and auroras and stuff during the full moon. So the full moon is the 7th. Um, the new moon is the 21st. And that is just after the solstice, which actually this year is 24 minutes past 9 on the 20th of March. And that is the point where the sun crosses the equator into the northern hemisphere and the day becomes longer than the night. So uh, that's your moon phases. Uh, we'll plan our observing sessions around that and we'll give you a form as to when, when they're on as well. Um, we know, you know we've got a, a new venue that we're trying out and it uh, seems to be working well. Now then, did anyone see, just before we came in, um, the total conjunction of the two planets? Yep. Yeah. I managed to get a few pictures and I, I, I stopped on the way just down by the docks and got some pictures through a gap in the clouds there. Um, this is um, the moon. Oh, it's not the moon. Sorry, what am I talking about? This, this, is, this is Jupiter and its moons and Venus. Um, but actually just over a moon diameter apart. And if you didn't see it tonight, you'll be able to see it tomorrow, weather permitting. And it'll be slightly different in that Venus will now be higher than Jupiter. The two, star, uh, the two planets are passing in the sky, Venus on the way up, Jupiter on the way down. So uh, you'll see a slightly different view of that tomorrow, hopefully. And then they, they'll still be there, but they'll be getting further apart as the, as the month goes on. Okay. Now you haven't seen that, so I turn the lights down a bit further? Yeah. Um, that's a general view looking southwards uh, at 8 o'clock tomorrow evening. Actually, I just picked that randomly. And you've got the two planets down the road bottom there in the, to the west. Venus and Jupiter. <coughs> and then you've got Orion over here in the south. Sirius is still nice and high up. That's well worth a look. Uh, quite a star in the sky. Nowhere near, of course, Venus and Jupiter. But uh, in terms of actual stars, Sirius is the brightest, and it twinkles away all sorts of colours. And you can, if you film that with a video camera, you can pick out individual frames that be all different colours. Uh, that's an interesting one there. So uh, Orion, usual signposting. You can find Orion's belt in the middle here. You can see sword down there. If you get a telescope on that, you can see Messier 42, the great Orion Nebula, um, and the Running Man, one or two others in that sword. Um, follow the belt downwards. And that points to Sirius. If you actually look at the whole of Canis Major, that actually does look something like a dog. Um, the little dog looks nothing like it, it's only two stars, so it could be anything. Um, follow the belt upwards and you come to Aldebaran. Aldebaran meaning eye of the bull, and that's in the Hyades cluster, which is the V shape that's the head of the bull here. Except that Aldebaran is actually not one of the Hyades cluster, it just happens to be. Um, in the same direction, but quite a bit nearer. Um, then you've got the planets down here, Venus and Jupiter. You find, it's quite you know, very dark with a sky there, Uranus. You can see Uranus, apparently some people can see it naked eye, I can't, but, uh, uh, but through binoculars um, it shows as a little green blob. You find Uranus there, that differentiates the other stars around it. And then further up, Mars is still quite bright. Mars is now moving back towards um, Gemini, and having been, it went through a retrograde bit between October and January where it was moving back towards Taurus, but it's now moving forwards again up into Gemini. And uh, that's, that's Mars, so that's a uh, good look at that part of the sky. I'll just look at a, a different part of the sky, um, a bit further sort of to the east. 
And you can start to see the constellations of spring coming out there because it's nearly spring. It's 20 days until spring. I'll keep hammering that point out um, every time I see Barrow West. But, uh, Here's Leo the Lion. Again, that's a constellation that doesn't these look something like what it is. You've got bright star regulus at the front here, and then this sort of backwards question mark or sickle shape that shows the head of the lion and then the lion's tail down here. Um, so that's what I mean, sort of an indicator that spring is not far away. Um, and just to look a bit closer into that, um, now this is here's Leo, and we've got some interesting sort of galaxies here. We've got the Leo triplet, which is three galaxies there, and we have another three galaxies that's not called the Leo triplet, um, just up here. But mostly we've got, in between Leo and Virgo down here, the star of India Matrix in Virgo, and Nebula in Leo, we've got this area here called the Realm of the Galaxies. And it is literally just jam-packed with galaxies. Uh, and uh, it's a well worth looking around there with a, if you've got a big telescope, of Dobsonian of some sort, um, you'll look around that area and you'll just see galaxy after galaxy. And uh, there's a close view. Uh, that's an area of sky called Markarian's Chain. That's well worth a look and you'll get uh, better looks at that um, during, uh, during April and, and May until really the sky gets to the point where deep sky observing is, uh, is off for the summer uh, because it never properly gets dark. So um, then just one more thing really, oops, sorry, wrong. Um, one more thing, Ray, if you get up early in the morning, I'm sorry to tell you that at five o'clock tomorrow morning when this is set for, I will be on my way to work because I'm setting up the breakfast news in the morning uh, on Friday. But, uh, so I might see this, but uh, I'll probably be busy driving the car rather than looking out the window. Um, and uh, lots of galaxies in Sagittarius. Um, so lots of, sort of nebulae, Messier objects, globular clusters, that sort of thing. And this is all coming out now. This is the, this is the beginning of the start of summer, visible at five o'clock in the morning now. So, um, so that's plenty to look at. Um, I'll just stay safe and keep looking up. And I will now hand over to Terry, who will do his teaser. Right, thanks, Paul. Now, you'll be glad to know I'm not going to ask you anything about nuclear physics or heliosismology or anything like that. Something that you have to think about yourself. And that's encouraging thinking rather than just looking up Google as I was a good exercise for the brain. So if you were standing on the sun, if that was possible, looking at the Earth, in what constellation would the Earth be right now? And it's easy to work out when you think about it. Okay, I'll give you a bit of a clue. If you are looking at the Earth from the sun, it's obviously going to be directly opposite from us looking from the Earth to the sun. Now, you may or may not know if you sort of are a follower of astrology, what your star sign is, and uh, if it happens to be uh, right about the moment, you will know that the sun is in Pisces. Okay? So, if the sun is in Pisces, Earth is going to be 180 Leo, degrees Leo. opposite to Leo. that in the sky. Leo. Good man, George. <laughs> How did you work that out? Because I was playing George James, they were just playing right. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's run with that. No, the way to think about point. it is the Earth is moving northwards, and as Paul was saying there, in about, uh, what, just under 20 days, it's going to be crossing the equator. So it's moving northwards, and at the moment it's just about south of the equator. Six months from now, it's going to be just north of the equator and moving southwards. And if you know the sky reasonably well, just north of where the ecliptic meets the equator, as it's going down that way, is in Leo. So well done. Right, Mars or Monkey Lane? <laughs> right. <laughs> that was easy. Right. Well, that's true. Thank you, Terry. You have me scratching my head on that one, but uh, I've got there in the end too. <laughs> um, right. So anyway, I'm going to hand over to our main speaker tonight, who uh, is a long-term friend of the association, Dr. Ryan Lillian. Um, Ryan um, used to be a lorry driver, actually, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 
Um, and uh, he then sort of uh, decided that astrophysics was his passion and Laurie Ryan was his work. So he came here to Queen's, did a uh, degree, PhD, and uh, has done work for um, the NASA Goddard Center, which is, is that the one in Virginia? I'm just going to scratch that. Maryland, just as it is. Maryland, it's, it's near Washington somewhere, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so he's been there. And he's come back now to, um, to be a lecturer here at Queen's. Um, he's been involved in some, some very exciting uh, projects. I saw, I saw um, Peter Stewart here, actually, this evening. Peter? Uh, yeah, it's happy to, yeah. Um, there's you two over lorry with a radio telescope on, didn't you, from, from the Netherlands to, um, to the low far place of Burr, which is, that must have been quite an adventure. But uh, anyway, without further ado, I'll hand over to Ryan, and Ryan, the floor is yours, and we'll see if we can make the technology work. <laughs> Sigmoidal kind of shape. And if you watch that region carefully, 
uh, over the space of a few days. It seems to erupt twice. Um, but it's there, it is there, there's the first flare, and then another day later or so, I think we get the M6, was, was the big one there, so that one sort of had the ejected all that material off, off in the space. And of course, this location on the solar disk there means we're more magnetically tied to Earth when it's over to the right, because the, the magnetic field, the Parker spiral is then magnetically connected to Earth. But as I said, there's no real sunspot in that group, so you can still get these large geoeffective eruptions not associated with, with any uh, you know, sunspots. So this is just the chronograph images from Lasco. Here we have the, the flare happened here. You should get the CME coming up behind it. There it is there. It's a nice big halo CME, and that was, that was what gave us these spectacular displays uh, over, over the weekend and lasted for a couple of days. Fast forwarding then to yesterday, again focusing back on to 1324, this region, so the, the region for just that flare has now gone, gone beyond the limb, and so we've been tracking this large sunspot group here, and it's up until yesterday, Paul mentioned the M8 flare that happened yesterday, it had been fairly quiet, um, and as part of my research, I'm a, uh, what's called the Chief Observer of the Max Millennium Program for Solar Flare Research, and we issue solar flare forecasts to a daily uh, email alert system. And uh, not for space weather prediction purposes, but it's to coordinate telescopes on the ground in the space to try and collect as much data as we can on individual events. So if you have multiple sunspots uh, on, on the solar disk, and we pick a target region, then everyone tunes their, um, their telescopes to that region. We, we try to get as much data to try and understand them. And when we anticipate uh, some high activity, we issue what's called a major flare watch. And we use them pretty sparingly because uh, we don't want to waste people's time. But when I, I'm on duty this week, funnily enough, and what I noticed about this region, if I can make this movie play, you can see these two sunspots in the far left corner are start to coalesce and rotate. So that twisting and the shearing, should we make that movie actually? Well, let's let that play again. It'll work. So you can see these two sunspots just to the left doing this kind of magnetic dance. So there, these are regions of negative ma magnetic polarity. But when I looked at the magnetogram data, what I saw, if you look, oh, I've got another arrow here, sorry. Right in here, I'll flip back and forward, that small white patch there, that's a positive magnetic field embedded within a negative polarity sunspot. And then you get that, that's, that's known as how we categorize these sunspots as delta sunspots, when you have competing magnetic polarities within a single sunspot. But add to that the rotation motion of those two sunspots, you get incredible shearing. And that magnetic field is getting twisted and strained beyond belief. It's like, I always use the analogy of the tectonic plates here on Earth, you get this pressure builds up as two tectonic plates push against each other, and something slips, and you get an earthquake. So I, when I saw that, I was like, that's going to flare. That's going to produce a big flare. So I issued a statement to the, to the community saying that we believe this, uh, this rotating, which may induce significant shearing motion along the magnetic polarity inversion line, we're implementing a major flare watch at this time, expecting some major eruption in the next day or two. Five hours later, I mean, so I was quite proud of myself. <laughs> I really don't know what about so I looked at these kind of images for 20 years. Uh, you sort of become a bit, for, a bit familiar with what, what to look for. And this is kind of, these are the kind of things that human observers are more in tune to than you know, machine learning or, or computer algorithms may not sort of pick up on. But that's, that's how we can essentially predict that these events are going to happen to some degree of, of accuracy. But unfortunately, there was no CME associated, at least no geo-effective CME. This was this kind of small uh, outburst that accompanied that flare, so no aurora expected um, from, from that event, unfortunately. Um, so, coming back to my own research, so why do we understand research solar activity? Um, so, the, as we know, there are these colossal uh, releases of energy in, in the sun's atmosphere. There are very efficient particle accelerators and the physics behind them still eludes a lot of uh, modern research. How does the sun affect these, uh, accelerate these particles so efficiently? And how do these particles in turn drive increases in the radiation that we can see from these beautiful images from Solar Dynamics Observer, for example? How does the energy get distributed through the sun's atmosphere? But more importantly, what are the effects of this radiation on our planet? So that's something we're trying to address here at Queen's. 
and uh, just very fundamentally here's the cartoon that we often uh, show off for, for how a flare works. You have magnetic, uh, magnetic feed lines that are obviously directed. They reconnect due to this shearing that I mentioned in that sunspot motion. And that somehow converts this magnetic energy into particle acceleration or heating. And that's what drives the flare. So generally, uh, we, we tend to think of flares as a chromospheric uh, phenomenon. So that a lot of this energy, that these electrons, deposit their energy in the sun's chromosphere, cause it to heat up and expand, and that's where a lot of our, our radiation comes from. So, as amateur astronomers, I'm sure you're all very familiar with H-alpha. Um, you probably have, have you've got solar telescopes, I don't personally, but I'm sure a lot of you do, have got H-alpha filters, and you see these beautiful structures in the sun's atmosphere, and filaments and prominences, and sunspots and so on, but for my, most of my talk now, I want to talk about line and alpha. So, you know your atomic physics, um, hydrogen alpha or H alpha as it's commonly known is the 3 to 2 transition of a neutral hydrogen atom. So you have an electron that drops from the third atomic orbital, orbital to the second one and releases a photon. And this, uh, this radiation comes off in the optical part of the spectrum which is why it's so easy to observe from the ground. But line alpha is the 2 to 1 transition. So same hydrogen atom, one proton, one electron but now the electron is dropping from the second orbital down to the ground state. Um, and to us, it's just an abundance of riches in terms of trying to understand the sun's behavior. So I'm going to try and convince you it's a very important emission line uh, to be observing solar activity in. And again, this is just a schematic, so it's again, just repeating what I've said. It's formed in the chromosphere, temperature of sort of a few tens of thousands uh, of Kelvin. During the solar flares, they, they would accompany the ribbon processes like you would see in the chromosphere. That's similar to what you would see in H-alpha or any other chromospheric emission line and it's, and it's optically thick. But why are we interested in studying? Scientifically, um, there's a number of different things. Most um, practically, I suppose, it's based on the perspective. So line and alpha photons cause the photo dissociation of molecular water in the, in the mesosphere here on Earth, generating ozone. So a lot of our ozone comes from uh, line and alpha photons, and it actually creates the D layer of the atmosphere. So when you're bouncing radio frequencies around the world, you, they ricochet off the bottom layer of the atmosphere, known as the D layer. So the D layer itself actually disappears at night when the night side of the Earth is no longer susceptible to the sun's radiation. Uh, but all those line and alpha photons uh, are, give us what's called our, our ionosphere. So this is important for in the case of like satellite drive, radio communication, GPS accuracy and stuff. So, in, in principle, if the sun's output changes its in line and alpha, then it has consequences for our atmosphere as well, and atmosphere as well, and too. And this is just a sort of a schematic here of our atmosphere, where different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum in the extreme ultraviolet get, deposit their energy right over here, on the right-hand side, this bright patch, that's line and alpha. So it gets absorbed in about 80 to 100 kilometers above our heads. Um, from a heliophysics point, point of view, we think it's a significant radiator of flare energy. So, when I talked about these electrons, accelerated particles, causing this heating process within, um, within solar flares, a lot of that radiation that is generated comes out in the form of light and alpha emission as well. And in further field, as we search for habitable exoplanets around other stars, the knowledge of the stars' light and alpha uh, radiation field is crucial for trying to understand how those planets could be susceptible to, to stellar radiation. Um, very quickly, just stellar line and alpha is very difficult to observe, unlike on the Sun, because it's so heavily attenuated by the interstellar dust and interstellar medium. And so there's a lot of effort goes into trying to uh, recreate what the star's radiation field would be in line and alpha. And, and even to do that often takes exposure times of thousands, if not tens of thousands of seconds to build up enough signal to, to de detect that, and if you do that, you wash out any sort of science activity on the star. So the, observing the sun gives us an insight into how this other stellar activity might behave uh, at, this, at this wavelength. And so studies of the sun in Lyman Alpha mission have gone on for decades. Nothing really new there. We observe solar cycle behavior in sort of the medium and the long term, so you've got active regions and sunspots coming and going and change the amount of Lyman Alpha mission. And of course, over solar cycles themselves, and here's uh, a plot by Tom Woods, and you can see how the sun's output changes over monthly periods and sort of yearly periods. 
But I'm trying to do it on shorter time scales, and like the time scales of solar flares of minutes, tens of minutes, has been incredibly difficult. So a lot of the instruments that we've had have not had the sensitivity, the cadence, or the duty cycle to capture these rapid changes that we would associate with solar flares. A lot of the, the few observations that we do have are spatially and spectrally integrated, so we don't have any spatial information on where the emissions come from. We can speculate because of what we know of hydrogen alpha and other uh, chromospheric lines that they must behave similarly, but we've never got an image of um, solar flares in line with alpha emission. And of the few emissions we have, few observations we have, uh, several of them can contradict one another. This is just one example I wanted to show of the same solar flare. It's an M2 flare from 2010. This data set was observed by the Proba 2 spacecraft, which is run by the Royal Observatory in Belgium. This is the same flare observed by the GOES uh, satellite run by NOAA, and they give us completely different results. They look differently, they are different enhancements, so what's going on? These instruments should be telling us the same thing, but we still have not got a handle on, on, on these observations yet. Um, so recently, you're probably all familiar with the GOES series of spacecraft. This is where we get our, our solar flare classification from. So it's, GOES is primarily a, a weather satellite. They're positioned uh, over the continent of the United States to monitor hurricanes and, and tornadoes. But they also have built-in space environment monitors that we monitor the X-ray flux and, and solar behavior. This is where we get our ABCMX classification for solar flares from the GOES X-ray sensors. But um, going back into 2001, uh, a few of them have had these um, extreme ultraviolet sensors developed that also carry line and alpha channels. And so I've been sort of capitalizing on this data set. They've only released about six years of data. Um, <coughs> we'll skip over some of that. So this is the six year period uh, of data that they have released until actually I got an email just on the way here saying they've now released all the data since then. Um, for these instruments, but there are about 700 large MX class flares. So you can see the variability here due to the active regions and over the course of the solar cycle. And what I did in this plot was then detrain that data. So I wanted to remove that long term variability from the, from the time series to see how the flares looked. And here now you can see the variability, all these spikes are individual flares. And these dips that we see, these are biannual dips of twice a year. Goes, which is a geostationary spacecraft of about 30,000 kilometers, looks through the Earth's outer atmosphere known as the geo corona. And that geo corona, which is basically a supply of hydrogen atoms, absorbs the sun's line and alpha emissions. This is another problem that we're faced with when trying to make these measurements from space. And even our low Earth, low Earth uh, orbit spacecraft are embedded in that geo corona. So we, when we, the measurements that we take have been diluted, we think, from coming from the sun towards Earth. So goes is out beyond that. Um, so at least we get some periods where it's not obscured by this geo absorption. So this is a picture of the Earth taken by the Apollo 16 astronauts back in 72, and you can see this haze around the planet, and that's, that's this cloud of hydrogen atoms around the Earth that's absorbed in the solar radiation. Um, more recent studies have said that the mouse extends beyond the moon. I'll sort of skip over that bit. So what do we find? So we find that the, the, the changes in uh, Lyman Alpha output of the sun during solar flares is very, very small. It's on the order of a few percent. Um, so from around the 500 flares that I looked at, they're in around, this, this is a histogram here of the M and X class flare, their enhancements, the peak of the flare relative to their background value or something. So they're about, you know, sort of up to about 10%. The largest we find was about a 30% increase. And when you think, Compare that to the X-ray emission that we see. X-rays change by factors of 100,000, 10,000, even a million over the course of the flare. So very, very minuscule uh, changes, but very, very energetic. So this is the same, the same flares on a scatter plot. So we've taken the total amount of energy that the radiant in the Lyman alpha emission compared that to the X-ray. It's about 100 times more. So while the changes that the Lyman alpha uh, induced in the sun's radiance, they're very small, it packs a hell of a, a, hell of a punch. Uh, and I'm saying not every flare is unique, and we've, we've only conducted the study really for the larger uh, solar flares, but we've even found some smaller flares that have bigger line and alpha enhancements than some X class flares. I think we don't have anything, we, we're piecing together the puzzle with the instruments and the data sets that we have, but we think this is due to a failed filament eruption for this particular event. So you've got this cloud of 
material. It's like a field CME that just doesn't have enough energy to escape, or there's some magnetic sort of net that's holding the thing down on the sun, and all the hydrogen atoms in that net are getting excited and, and emitting the line off the mission. Um, we also observed that there's some of this, what's called the centrical limb variation, so the flares that happen closer to the edges of the sun will produce less of an enhancement than if they occurred close to, close to disk center. And this is because the sun's atmosphere itself is scattering those photons along the line of sight as we measure. So you probably heard of limb darkening uh, in terms of stellar profiles and similar, similar kind of effect. The photons towards the edges of the have more mass to get through before they get to us, so we see less of it than they would uh, as if they were just coming straight at us from the center. And in order to verify that, what you'd need to do is have a spacecraft positioned at different positions in the solar system, observing the same flare simultaneously. And in fact, that's what we were able to do um, using data set during the solar flare in 2014. So you can see here's an SDO image of a flare, X-class flare, happening on the eastern end of the sun, uh, as viewed from Earth. But we also have spacecraft around Mars that also has a Lyman Alpha Observer uh, channel on board. So for us, uh, the flare happened to the east of the limb. At this position in the, in the cycle, at the time of the flare, Mars was about 90 degrees to Earth. So the Maven spacecraft, it's a NASA spacecraft in orbit around Mars, also has a Lyman Alpha filter on it, similar to what we have for those. So we can actually do stereoscopic observations of the same flares at different vantage points of the solar system. And when, we, when we correct for that Earth-Mars distance and the light travel time, you see that the flux received at Mars was much, much higher than what we received here at Earth. So that was a, that was a good corroboration that we could actually verify this effect uh, simultaneously. Um, so we're still aware of this. So it's another thing we were actually able to detect a type of sunquake in line and alpha mission. Um, again, you can see this is a, a detrend of the data here again. This is when the solar flare starts. Here's the peak of the flare, and when the flare ends, you can see this oscillatory pattern as the flare seems to be causing the chromosphere to, to ring like a bell uh, at this uh, acoustic cutoff frequency. But what I'm interested in now is in what, what effect might this have on our, our atmosphere? So there have been studies done of other oscillations and, and periodic behavior during solar flares. My colleague Laura Hayes from Dublin, and she's uh, tracked these disturbances again using SDO and GO spacecraft. So here's a solar flare. You can see from the patch on the right, there's this the, the, the emission is being pulsed by some kind of mechanism on the sun, and this plot on the bottom shows the disturbance of the atmosphere. So they track each other. So as the, as the, sun, as the flare pulses itself with these different bursts of radiation, it's causing a similar effect in our atmosphere as well. And she actually verified that using data from um, Bird, kind of the the radio telescopes. This is the same flare, and you can see the density increase with the, with the uh, Atlantic Ocean. It changes in density due to the changes in radiation due to the flare. So there is a real one-to-one -one connection between these emissions going on in the sun and the impact that they have here on Earth. I'm going to skip over this. Um, and just, just to say that I've done a uh, venture more into the field of space weather myself, and uh, sort of trying to understand the impact of this line of radiation. So here's a, an X-class flare again from 2011. This is the sub solar point over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and now that we have these line of observations from those on the X-rays, which are also a driver of space weather, we, we match them back to ground-based ionospheric monitors. Uh, we used a VLF receiver across the continent of the United States, and we also used a microtometer in Japan, these sample different layers of our atmosphere, so we can actually track to see where the radiation is being deposited in our atmosphere in different phases of the flare. So this box was one to take in here, but basically this black curve here is the line of alpha. The green is the microtometer data, so this is ionized uh, nitric oxide in the E layer, and you see they track each other quite closely. Then the X-rays come along, and then later on we get this uh, response deep down in the D layer to the VLF. Uh, observation. And this goes against uh, the commonly accepted theory that and even the textbooks that talk, talk about solar terrestrial environment have sort of dismissed Lyman Alpha as a kind of space weather driver at all because it had been assumed that these changes uh, in the radiance of this wavelength were so small they may as well be insignificant. So they've said that these, these space weather effects are now attributed to the X-rays. 
So we've shown here how in the Queen's last period that that's no longer the case. Uh, I still like this quote from the book, though, is that one good reason for studying the effects of solar fires is that nuclear explosions also create uh, dramatic effects in the atmosphere, and it's important not to confuse the two. Um, keep sticking to the atmosphere just very, very briefly. Um, last year, the Fermi spacecraft detected the largest ever gamma ray burst uh, ever detected. Follow up observations placed that were about uh, 600 megaparsecs away, and the effects of this were also felt here in Ireland as well over our atmosphere. And again, Laura Hayes and collaborator Peter Gallagher were able to track the, the ionospheric disturbance due to this gamma ray burst. So, Earth's in a shooting gallery from both the sun and from external sources as well. To try and understand the different effects of different astrophysical phenomena is a huge part of our research. Uh, skip over that, I'm sort of getting on with the time. So, bringing us up to date, the more, more recent launch um, in February 2020, ESA launched their year, uh, the latest flagship mission, the Solar Orbiter spacecraft. Um, this is a uh, state of the art instrument designed to primarily understand the origins of the solar wind. Um, from the sun and the effects that it can have on Earth as well. But in order to do that, we have to get right up close to the sun. So a lot of the instruments and satellites that we have here on Earth, by the time that solar wind has reached us, it's the, a lot of the information about the origins of it is lost um, on, its way to, on its way through space. So this is the, uh, the orbit of solar orbiter doing Venus and Earth flybys. So it's, um, so it's trying to get closer and closer inside and closer and closer into the, into the sun, probably inside the orbit of Mercury, but at the same time it's trying to get outside the ecliptic plane. So it's usually the flybys, not just to get closer to the sun, but to get out of the ecliptic plane to be able to look down at the poles, which is an advantage point we've never really had on, on the sun before. So that's this is where it is today, or tomorrow I think is as close as I can get this movie to make it to today, but it does have a line and alpha imager on board. So we're very excited to hopefully uh, capture some good observations from it, except because of its orbit and, and it has to do these flybys from Earth and sometimes it's behind the sun, it only has very short discrete observing windows, it only does these in blocks of like 10 days or so when they take these high, high uh, resolution observations and then again it takes a long time for them to dump that data back down to Earth and stuff. So it's, it's, it's state of the art, it's, it's cutting edge stuff but it is limited in what it can tell us as well. Just want to show you this movie. So this is the images of the sun taken with the high resolution imager on board so we're, as it approaches uh, the sun. So it's 304 here, 304 on the left, and iron 9174 on the right, Corona. And you can see it as this is it actually getting in closer over the, over the cruise phase since launch up till uh, quite recently. So quite a picture. So the, the cameras are actually designed to always have the full sun in the field of view. So no matter how close it gets to the sun, the, the, the angle of the cameras on the spacecraft are wide enough to always keep the whole, the whole sun in the field of view. So very briefly, this is a, a movie from the Lyman Alpha channel. So it can't see the entire sun. It can only look in a, on, a, on a very uh, narrow window range. And I'm going to play this movie. Very little changes. So this came as a very big surprise. So we're hoping to see, you, know, you can imagine how the H Alpha movie would have looked over the same time period. It would have been very dynamic, we've seen fibrils and uh, Ellerman bombs and all these sorts of exotic phenomena. Lyman Alpha is very, very static, or at least so we thought. So they've actually traced this back to a problem with the camera in that the charge between images, so this, their CCD cameras, just like you have on your phone or your digital SLRs, but the charge after each image doesn't dissipate quickly enough and it resides onto the next image frame. So you have this ghosting effect uh, from one frame to the next. So we think that's what may be causing this, this blurring out, this smearing out of any of the actual um, truly dynamic phenomena that we would have expected to see. So a bit of an oversight on these in that part and I think they're looking into it. But finally, we have an image of a solar flare. So in March of last year, it captured an M3 solar flare. I'm going to show it. It happens right to the top of this, this image, just up in this notch here. This is priority data, by the way. So there's the flare. Very short. But again, you can 
So here you see again the, the, the bright ribbon structures that we used to see in other channels such as, as 304. So we're very excited for this, but at the same time the image quality is not quite as good as we would have hoped. There's a bit of blurring. It looks a lot blurrier and fuzzier than what we might have expected. And again, there's another instrumental effect. Because the satellite's so close to the sun, when they open the doors of the cameras, there's a thermal effect that causes the camera to heat up and that distorts the optics inside the camera and causes the the, the, the resolution to degrade significantly. So another effect that they think they would have actually tried to plan out uh, in advance. But it's the best we have, like I said, having, so doing my alpha data is hard. Like they, they really been trying so hard to push for these observations uh, for many, many years, and it's finally starting to come together. Um, and so following from Orbiter, uh, the Chinese launched the uh, Advanced Solar Observatory spacecraft in October of last year, it has two Lyman Alpha instruments. It'll have a Lyman Alpha imager and a Lyman Alpha coronagraph. Um, they said, their website says, that I mean, that their data will be released three to six months post launch. So we're in that period now and we're really anticipating these data. And they say they'll be made publicly available to the community. So we're really, really excited to see what these images look like. Because again, the sun's been terribly active lately, so they will likely have caught a lot of flares in the Lyman Alpha channel uh, with, the, with this mission. Uh, as we explained to Terry earlier, and uh, this time next year I'm going up to Poker Flats, Alaska, where we're testing out a different type of Lyman Alpha camera on a sounding rocket. It's called SNFs, Solar Eruption Integrated Field Spectrograph. So we're a small six-person science team, and NASA have funded our rocket. And we're going to go on a five or a ten-minute rocket flight uh, from Alaska and try and capture a solar flare in that time period. So. I've, um, and of course, our, our launch window is actually going to coincide with solar orbit coming back around Sun Earth line. So, this time next year, orbit is going to come back in in front of the Earth to be looking at the Sun from our vantage point as well. We're going to launch, uh, we've got a 10 day launch window in mid March next year, and we're going to try and do joint observations with solar orbit during a five year rock fight. And I'll not play this whole next video. If anybody gets motion sickness, you might not want to watch this. This spins a lot. A sounding rocket. This is a, this is a sounding rocket launch. This is actually the it's a calibration rocket for the Solar Dynamics Observatory being launched from Wallace. But this is essentially what we're going to do. We put cameras on the back of the of the rocket. Oh, hang on, it was launching. Here's our trajectory. So we go outside the Earth's atmosphere to get away from any interference. There it goes. Get dizzy very, very quickly. It starts to spin. See the sun. This is the forward-facing camera on its way to the sun, and here's the rear-facing camera looking back down the ground in, I believe, New Mexico or so. So these are suborbital flights. They go a bit higher than a, say, a balloon launch, but they're primarily designed to test these new types of cameras before they stick them on a, say, a billion dollar spacecraft or something. So we, we were doing this for we we're doing this for cheap uh, and testing these, these, these new type of cameras that basically allow us to, to get uh, spectral profiles for every pixel within our, the CCD of our image. Settle down a little bit better. Very good. Uh, now it is in space. You can see it looking back down on the Earth and it's trying to center its, its front facing cameras onto, onto the sun. Lock in, it'll reach Apogee here, taking data for five, six, seven minutes, and then falls back to Earth, we have to go and find it again. No, no telemetry on board, unfortunately. So that's, that's this time next year, we're very excited for that. Uh, looking a wee bit further ahead, Solar Sea, it's a Japanese mission due for launch in 2027, also will feature a Lyman Alpha instrument. And the Japanese have a tradition where they don't name their spacecraft until they're safely in orbit. So um, Solar A eventually became the Yoko spacecraft back in the 1980s. And uh, Solar B became the Node A um, back in 2006, a mission I worked on a little bit for a while. And so this will be Solar C. So I'm on the science team for the Lyman Alpha for this. So the Lyman Alpha channel will focus the emission of the chromosphere, which affects the Earth's mesosphere. These observations sub second kid, so I'll just study the highly dynamic ablution of solar flares and the reaction to Earth's atmosphere. So, again, a lot of push is going towards understanding the effects of these flares, particularly in this, this wavelength of light that we really haven't had access to for decades and, and how it uh, affects us 
So we'll have two instruments on board, the EVST, the Extreme Motor Violence Solar Telescope, which will have a spectrometer, covering Lyman Alpha and Sospen, which is a team I'm a part of, which is a Lyman Alpha irradiance instrument. And then, coming back to GOES, there's a new series of GOES spacecraft called the GOES-R, so it consists of, it's of four, uh, four, rock, four satellite um, phase, so GOES-R and SMT, I think have already been launched. <coughs> GOES-U is for launch in a couple of years' time, and they also feature new, new improved and advanced uh, alignment alpha instruments. So, we're set to get a lot of information over the next, certainly for the parts of this solar cycle, but for perhaps the next one or two solar cycles beyond. We're very excited for that. I have all my PhD students and postdocs frantically trying to piece together bits of information that we have already based on these limited observations so we can plan for how to process this data um, on down the line later on. That's a bit of an overview of the, the research that I'm sort of involved in mostly here at Queen's and with collaborators abroad. But um, I just wanted to finish up with a quick overview of solar eclipses. I'm sure there's a few other uh, eclipse chasers in the audience as well. So, so far to date, I've been to 10 solar eclipses, nine totals and one annular. The uh, first one was in Turkey in 2006. Uh, Faroes, Nebraska, Chile, Argentina, Tanzania, where Terry and I actually bumped into each other, Siberia, China, Australia, and Indonesia. And uh, so tried to, desperately to try and get a couple of pictures. Profession to some of you are probably are here, but these are a few snapshots uh, from my travels over the past couple of decades. In fact, I've been in Faroe Islands, unfortunately. Um, one video I do like to show, um, which is a lot easier than taking pictures, just set a GoPro camera up in a, in a corner somewhere and you can safely enjoy the eclipse. This was from 2019 in, in Argentina. A group of us were there for a solar physics conference. Here the eclipse shadow coming in. This is a time lapse video, so it's about an hour's worth of observations in, in the space of a minute and I just loved to have seen, I'd seen ones like this before where I wanted to capture that sweeping shadow across across the sky. I'll just let that play one more time. Very uh, very lunar landscape we're at this point to try and capture this event. Here it comes. You can see the sunset distance. Three or four minutes of totality off the went, and then we had another sunset a few minutes later when, when the sun actually set. Um, I did try to get down to Chile in 2020. I don't know if you remember, there was a bit of a pandemic going on back then, but I sort of uh, took a bit of a risk and flew down to Chile and drove uh, down south through Santiago. But that was as far as I got, thrown away clouds. And that was the only cloud for the day. The rest of the day was, was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Those are the breaks. So I'm sure you're aware in just a few weeks' time there's a hybrid solar eclipse that will be visible from uh, the coast of, west coast of Australia, uh, parts of Indonesia if it's not too cloudy, although the forecast is not great for there. And this is a hybrid eclipse, so it's not total across its entire path. And as it goes across, it's due to the curvature of the Earth, so it's the logistics. And there, I now have uh, uh, booked a campsite right on the center line, uh, pretty close, so I should get maximum amount of totality, but I just need to get in there a couple of days early, probably in the setup camp. So, getting there, flying from Belfast to Dublin, flying to Munich, to Bangkok, to Singapore, to Perth, and then a thousand mile drive outside the western coast for a one minute um, total solar eclipse. So, anyone who's seen one knows why, you know why we did it. <laughs> um, after that, later this year, there's an annual eclipse across the, across the US as well, but that's really just the the, the opening act for the big event this time next year or April next year when we have another total solar eclipse following on from the, the massive one in, in 2017. This one this time cuts up through the Pacific, Mexico, uh, Eastern US and sort of Canada and so on. So again, this is this is actually just a couple of weeks after our rocket launch in Alaska. So I'm hoping to just stay there and go from Alaska straight down to Mexico. I'm planning a couple of solar physics conferences in Texas for that year as well. A bit closer to home. Uh, 2026 is one across Spain, comes through sort of Madrid, Barcelona direction in a one and a half minute to two minute eclipse, depending on where you are in Spain, but a lot more accessible than, than flying to the other side of the world. Uh, I, I gave the parts of this talk as part of the Science Festival, this is why I'm kind of putting it up again, but here's my list for the rest of the decade of all the total annular and, and hybrid eclipses and where they can be viewed from. So, 
anybody who's lost their travel niche for the last couple of years wants to get up and about again, now is your chance. Um, I'd also like to show this, so I think we at least get a partial solar eclipse here in Belfast most years this decade, so we don't get one in 2023 or 2029, but every other year we pretty much get some form of partial eclipse. We had one here in October, uh, just, just passed, and then of course the next one will coincide with the one in the United States in, in 2024. Again, when is the next total solar eclipse visible from Belfast? Oh, from Belfast. From Belfast. That's from Ireland's 2019. Two thousand three hundred and something, I think, from Belfast. Twenty-one fifty-one. Twenty-one, not too bad. Not as long as as we'd hoped to have, have to wait, but yeah. Uh, anybody wants to see what we're like? Twenty twenty-six is probably the best option. Um, easy jet flight down to Spain, or you can go to Bangor. Um, so there's the now the the Iron Place in, in Space Trail has just opened up uh, along the northbound coast. This was previously. Up in Derry, uh, started out last summer, and then came down to Devils Mountain, and then went over to Cambridge for a while. And I think Liverpool had ended up with some logistic problems here. But they've been told they still haven't done it yet. But if you stand at Earth at the Folk and Transport Museum and look back at the moon towards the sun, everything it's all to scale that you can essentially create the solar eclipse in culture in culture. So it was, uh, if Stephen Smart, our professor here in the Astrophysics Research Centre, has done his calculations, you could probably mimic. To the solar eclipse from Coltra. And I'm plugging this because I had a wee bit of a hand in shipping it around. Um, Stephen Swart and the team at the Nerve Centre found out there was a solar physicist from Belfast with a HGV licence. And so I got roped in <laughs> transporting the sun and the earth into the Glenshade Pass, coming down from Derry last year in Belfast. And that, that was a lot of fun to do. So, following up from my space trucking days of the, of the low fire telescope, this was, this was a, almost as good. Almost as good. That's all I got. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was absolutely excellent. And thank you for uh, just rekindling my memories of. I've seen three tables, so. Like. Not as many, but I know exactly the feeling because I went to a place called Seduna in South Australia in uh, oh, yeah. December 2002. Uh, well, that's a 25,000 mile round trip, which is a three week holiday in Australia. <laughs> and um, that lasted 32 seconds. <laughs> okay, you and yes, I'd absolutely do it again. Yeah. Anybody else could do. Right, I just want to ask really, um, we'll get some questions to the audience, mm -hmm. but I, I, I go first because I'm here. Yeah. Um, our understanding of the sun really has changed in, in the last 20, 25 years, or particularly. <clears throat> Um, are we there yet, or is, there, is it going to change again? I think the, the common theme, at least throughout my career, is that, you know, based on prior knowledge, we have a bunch of science questions that we want to answer, and we develop instruments and spacecraft and telescopes to answer those questions, but every time we do, it just raises more questions. And it's a, it's a never-ending yeah. uh, stream, I think, and I don't think we're going to be find it all out. I mean, the normal heating problem, we know the atmosphere of the sun is a thousand times hotter than the surface, we've known that for 150 years. We still don't explain it fully, fully. So, um, and I said more, and again, we, we've now, I didn't get to talk about Parker Solar Probe, I'm not, I'm not that involved with it, but both it and Solar Orbiter are as close to the sun as we've ever been or ever will probably get for a long time, and they're seeing new things that just we would not see from here. So I think there's, I think there's, there's, all right. Any questions? 